Hello, everyone. You're listening and watching another episode of Afghanistan by Afghans, where you get to learn the multifaceted stories of Afghans, the land of some 40 million people and who we are and how we think and what we do. And today I'm very excited, just like every other week with all my guests. I am always excited about my guests. <laughs> That's why they are my guests and they come on the show because <laughs> I'm excited about them and about who they are. Um, we're, today we're going to be speaking, we're going to go all the way down to Toronto or up, up east to Toronto, Canada, uh, and be speaking with Shahir John Zazai, Shahir Zazai, if we don't want to say the John in the middle, there you are. And so welcome to the show. Thank you for being here, Shahir John. Thank you for having me. Of course. And just by the way of a very brief introduction, and because the whole show is about you, just that Shahir John is a visual artist um, who has a show opening soon uh, at the Aga Khan Museum or Foundation, perhaps. Uh, I don't know Museum. what it's called. Yep. Museum. And uh, has done amazing and great work, uh, the link to which we will put on the description so you can check out some of his great work, uh, which we're going to explore throughout this show and this conversation. So without further ado, uh, welcome to the show, Shahir John. Thank you. Good to be here. Yes. So as I was mentioning to you off camera, uh, we always love to start the show by honoring the journey of your parents and forefathers from Afghanistan to the lands you are in now. So uh, tell us a little bit about your family and their journey from Afghanistan to Canada. I guess the journey is uh, it's, it's just like every other Afghan. We all live in chapters. So I was born in Afghanistan. Uh, we left when I was about six. We went, we went from Afghanistan to Pakistan, 92, 1992, uh, lived in Pakistan about 13 years before we immigrated to Canada. And it's been now 17 years. Strange to say 17 years, cause it's the bigger chunk of my life is now in Canada. And I always thought Pakistan was the biggest chunk. Mm. So that's, that's the journey. That's the journey. And, and where in Pakistan did you guys stay? In Islamabad. In Islamabad, right. And you guys yeah. came directly to Canada? Uh, sorry, to yes. Toronto? Yeah. Toronto, wow. And I don't think we've left this neighborhood for the 17 years we've been here. Oh, wow. Well, wow. is there a kind of a neighborhood with a lot of Afghans where you are? No, it's or? actually a less Afghan neighborhood. If, okay. If, it, if that can be the other version of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 That's cool. That's great. So t tell me now that um, the, the higher chunk is in Canada, <laughs> the 17 years <laughs> versus 16. Um, tell me a little bit about just a little bit of reflection on the past 17 years ago of, of life as an uh, Afghan Canadian. Um, any sort of experiences, any comments on identity, identity clashes, anything you like to share. Um, I think identity clash or identity in itself is, uh, it's almost like a never ending journey and never evolve. Ne it never stops evolving journey for us. And I think it's the same case with any other diasporas that we're all on a constant flux. Um, who we are and the version we hold on to is prescribed less lived. Um, I mean, the 17 years here would be the same as the 13 years in Pakistan is you live an Afghan version that you, you live the home version of Afghanistan over uh, the Afghan description of what an Afghan is, which I don't think there is a description. I think it goes out the window any day. Um, I was it's funny, this conversation, this, this topic, I had a conversation with the last Uber I took. Uh, Khudadad was uh, driving the Uber. I saw the name and I immediately was like, Afghan. Um, there was always that hesitancy when you first come across another Afghan. You're like, yeah, and then you're not as open immediately. Uh, but we had a great conversation and I was very surprised that he turned around. One of his questions was, he was like, it's going to be personal. If you don't want to discuss it, you don't have to. And that was his question. He was like, so what do you think our identity is? 
Wow. And I was like, loaded, but great. Because uh, it's, it's almost like what my practice has formed to be about. Um, and I was like, I don't think I can tell you. Like, I don't think you can tell me. I don't think anyone can tell us what our identity is because which one do you pick? Which Afghan do you say you are? If you were to choose the title Afghan to describe yourself by, are you the Afghan that was born in Afghanistan, raised in Pakistan, grew up in Canada? Are you the version that was born in Canada in an Afghan household, but has to live the dual identity of what you are outside the house. Sometimes our identity becomes five versions of the Afghans because you meet an Afghan and you're like a different version of Afghan with that Afghan. And then you meet a different version of Afghan, you transform again. So it's, it's so transformative and fluid that I don't think there can be one term that can define us anymore. And there's a whole other parallel to it that um, I, I mean, I, for me, I consider Afghanistan in in an inaccessible home. It's a home that is so inaccessible that uh, I think we've all been dispersed away from it. And the chance of reconnecting in person or getting to visit and then growing alongside it mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be an option for majority i can't say for everyone for majority that's the case so mm -hmm. it's like it's almost like you've left it lived its own version you lived your version the two became completely different things and somehow we're still prescribed the blanket term afghan mm -hmm. and put into that box and you have to respond to the world based on being put into that box so mm -hmm. I don't wow. know if I answered your question. Oh man, yeah, uh, answer you did, and you went way deeper than <laughs> we started off. But wow, you bring up so many different concepts that we can we can explore further and, and take. But I love that how you said to the last few sentences that how Afghanistan kind of lived its own version and and the diaspora people outside of it their own, and that's so true. And also, you know. You kind of, I like how you mentioned it as being different versions of Afghans. And, and mm -hmm. I always looked at it as a spectrum almost, uh, rather than versions yeah. of where we are in the spectrum of identity with our new identities and our old identities. And um, it's almost, it feels like that the displaced people of any region and country in the world perhaps goes through a very similar experience. Um, yeah. and. And I love that you also kind of pointed at some of the beauties of it. You know, so it was also great because it does bring out that perspective uh, that mm -hmm. would otherwise not be there, right? About identity, who we are as human beings, um, that would otherwise not be there. You know, had you not moved, you know, sixteen years there, seventeen years Honestly, here. Honestly, I yeah. it, 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 there's a lot to say about the the downside of being displaced. But I really give it a lot of credit. I think there is a, there there is a strength that you can have because of being displaced, because of having to gone through so much change and change of environments, uh, that it turns you into a different kind of a human. the The ability to blend in any group and setting, really, the credit goes to having to have to transform this frequently as yeah. a persona, as a, as a personality, as an identity, or just simply like you live in one type of population and demographic, and then you have to live in a different demographic and you just carry all these things forward. Um, I always compare it with the friends. I like my, my friends in Toronto who were born and raised in a specific neighborhood, you know, the ability to go back to the house you were born in and then grow up in the same neighborhood or city. In some cases, you've never left the city. Mm. The hesitation I see in them when they come across a non-person from outside their neighborhood, it's there. And mm. I don't see that in people in diaspora. People in diaspora is like, uh, you see an Arab, you immediately switch and you can 
talk to them in their way. You see somebody from Pakistan, you switch, you talk to them in their way. And I think that's, it's almost become like second nature. We don't think about it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But those are the strengths change can give you. Mm, yeah, that is so beautifully put. Yeah, exactly. We have to look at it from both perspectives. Uh, mm-hmm. And mostly, yeah, I think because the the negative side is so drastic and dramatic, we, we it's hard to leave that. For most of us, we're kind of stuck in that cycle. Uh, but yeah, like this, the added benefits that it gives us, the 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 resilience that is built from it almost right um yeah kind of brings that brings that up um and and I so think the negative is highlighted quite frequently for us mm-hmm. it's it's hard to escape it it's hard to escape uh every negative you can think of in relation to one of them mm-hmm. you know it's it's uh a non-afghan knows all the negatives and so so do we Mm-hmm. but we also have the advantage of being able to see the non-negative and to be able to bring ourselves to focus on that mm-hmm. can be helpful and might be helpful in being able to educate the ones that know only the negative about Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's beautifully put. And that's actually the whole aim of this show of this sort of oral history project, if we may call it, is is to be able to capture from firsthand resources such as yourself uh, that they have had access to the non-negative, the positive, Uh, because that's also part of healing and part of coming, because at some point we have to think about healing, right? At some point we have to think about overcoming these difficulties and moving on to the next stages of life. Um, without negating, of course, what has happened or what is happening, you know? Um, That's as much a reality as any other version. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Without any of that, how do we kind of step now into the healing process and um, or, or, or tap into a process that may have already been underway? How do we kind of give it voice and give it structure and grammar, um, you know, uh, as to what's happening to us? So... Um, this, of course, is a very uh, deep topic, and we can talk about it for hours, but I definitely <laughs> want to get into your art a little bit. Um, tell me a little bit um, about uh, your artistic endeavors or or creativity and where and how. I, I want to know a little bit of the roots before we get into, like, tell me what exactly you do with your art, kind of like what inspired you to kind of take on art. Um, where are the roots of, of this journey? Uh, I think the answer is going to sound quite cheesy. It's always been there. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't recall ever not drawing uh, from being a child to, I mean, actually I drew more as a child than I do now, um, but it was always there and it was encouraged. I mean, I'm, I'm quite thankful for that for my parents that they never discouraged me away from it. They encouraged it equally while telling us things that our parents do, which is uh, pick a path that will get you a good job. Uh, And those in their time were the generic things of becoming an engineer, becoming a doctor, uh, approaching life more practically that way. Uh, But I feel like uh, I proved that art is my focus and was not the simple proving of course it was like you got a's in one grade in one subject and the others were all the weak ones so it became evident after a little while that mm. i'm i'm not giving up on this path um mm. and then when we moved to canada i knew where ocad was ocad is the university i went to for my bachelor's um and our first few weeks or so i think within the first month of arriving in canada i walked over to the university and i was like i want to apply and this was like june or july july of 2005 and they were like oh you're late because applications for universities end in january february and i was like okay what do you want me what, what can i do and they were like well there's george brown college close by which is more a technical college. 
Mm. So I was like, okay, I walked over there and I asked them, I was like, I want to apply. And I scanned through their programs. And there was a program called Art and Design Foundation, which was a one-year course, a foundation course. So I applied for that and spent a year doing that. And as soon as the applications opened, I applied and switched. So that's my journey pre-university. Pre-university to university. So, and, and what exactly did you study in university? What was the name of the program? I applied for graphic design and very quickly switched to drawing and painting as a major. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so I did it, my bachelor's in fine arts. Fine arts. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Under the umbrella of fine arts. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask my question again, because I, I think um, when I say the what roots of... Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, the roots, of course, you, you went to your skill roots, and that's great, too. That's good to know, of course. I, 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 this is where my technical brain will give you technical answers. Okay. Um, but inspiration-wise, I think it was always around me. Mm -hmm. the, uh, you know what? I think it might be that the family, in the family, everybody's more literary-driven. Literature's always been around. Uh, history has always been around. So my interest in history, literature, of course, automatically makes mm. your imagination get a bit more active. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that might have been a factor. Um, my mom's uncle used to do these tiny watercolors, like they were not bigger than this. And they were, uh, if I think back now, it's very much like scenes of Afghanistan. You know, there's... There's green fields and then there's the mountains and a few uh, what you would call cypress trees or chinar trees. Uh, and that was it. Those were the little things. But uh, I feel like those are the little elements that were always around me that drove my uh, drive to want to paint and draw. I never really approached art from a Western perspective. It was not, it was not that, oh, look at that amazing painting. I want to make a painting like that. It was just, I wanted to draw. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, good. Okay. Now the second try, you, you answered it. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm joking on that. Of course, I love that you mentioned, uh, you know, inspiration from your uncle, as well as the encouragement from your parents, the encouragement uh, slash the disencouragement, of course, the reality check. Um, but on the encouragement, you know, it's kind of like reminds me of when an Afghan or you like says, oh, you know, my parents encouraged me, you know, in the arts, um, like the only thing in mass media we say is, you know, Afghan kids, uh, parents sending their kids to become child soldiers. You know, that's what's show. <laughs> you know, like, I like, oh, hold on a second. No, they are also encouraged or they're more encouraged to, um, do to other go and, things. <laughs> yeah, do other things than go and die. You know, it's like that's a yeah. very short career. Uh, you enter <laughs> at the age of 10, you're dead by 16, 18. Um, no parent really would want that, you know, as a, um, as a, unless they are also taking off in a few years and they're through a suicide bomb or something. And they're like, okay, you know, get ready. We're going to go together. I don't know. Things, but things that, got dark. <laughs> things just got dark. But, but that is really, no, I, I, I bring it out because of just the irony, uh, the irony and the, um, the patheticness of the concept, you know, to, to think that that's all we do and that's all all that uh, region is focused on. It's just so ridiculous. Um, uh, anyways, that's just, the, it reminded me of that as you were saying, oh, my parents encouraged me. Of course they did. Um, and and so you went into the arts with the graphic arts and, and now we can get into your art. Uh, by the way, is the painting that's behind you I've been wanting to ask, is that yours? Yeah, that's one of my... Okay. Okay. Let's see it. Oh, there we go. Thank you for showing it. Beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. And, you know, your parents' house becomes uh, the biggest collection of your own work. Is that the great. case right now? Okay, that's how it is. Okay, great. Um, and now, kind of getting a little bit deeper into your actual artwork. Um, one of the, your first pieces, or the pieces that that I that I was able to see, were the carpets that you designed and then were weaved in Afghanistan. You were telling me, uh, tell me if if those were one of your, and then your digital work, of course, which is a little bit more online, and and you share that a lot more often. But were what were some of your initial projects in school or right after school? What were you exploring? 
both artistically and conceptually, what ideas were you trying to explore with your art? I think the topic remained Afghanistan for a very long time. Uh, and it kind of, it, it, it's funny how in, in the Western platform of a gallery or a contemporary world and in their lens, how the image and perspective can be shifted. Um, when I graduated, when I finished my bachelor's, I got a solo show at this gallery at the time was known as two of two gallery. And uh, it's, it's the routine as galleries visit you during your thesis, final year presentation, somebody likes something, they'll be like, Oh, I want to show this. For me, every opportunity has always been a chance to make something new. So the gallery that approached me offered to show my thesis work. And I was like, can I just make new work? Mm. And they were like, okay. And I took that as a chance to make new work. And I called the exhibition Afghanistan. And the title of it was Afghanistan. The colors I used were the colors of the flag minus the green. Um, just using black and red as, from my perspective, those were the only true colors when it comes to representing the history. Um, so I used those two colors and I made a series of paintings and they were dark, they were red and black. Uh, but it was, I was very, uh, I was punchy with the way I was approaching art and what I was trying to say. I was not, uh, the work was not very open to dialogue in the way the art world functions. The art world now, my lesson is that the art world wants hints so that they can come and have a conversation with you about it because everything is so vague that they may be able to see something that you're trying to say. In the early versions, I was just like, black, red, here's a reality, let's talk about it. And it was too heavy for people to have a conversation about a topic like that, let alone that. Uh, on top of that, the topic is Afghanistan, everyone's already, already very clueless at that point. And this was 2010. Um, but for me, the few lessons along the way became a bit, the discouragement that exists out there was too many. Um, I just didn't give up. I just kept going. Mm. So my first show being called Afghanistan, I made personalized letters, letterheads, and I sent it out to anything Afghan that I knew of, which was very little. But as approaching it very um, academically, I had letterheads, I had personal envelopes, I sent it to embassies, I sent it to anything that was of importance as an Afghan. Mm. Not a single Afghan walked through the door. The exhibition was up for a month. Not a single Afghan walked through the door. Nobody ever responded to any of the letters or emails. And I was like, what the hell? You know, like, here you are trying to make an effort to have a conversation about Afghanistan. And of course, now when I think back, I was not ready to have normal conversation, which was gentle. I was not being gentle about having a conversation and neither did I think it was valid enough to be having a gentle conversation about Afghanistan. So mm -hmm. that show went by. The next exhibition was called A Failed Revolution. As you can see, the topics never became light. Um, <laughs> but fast forward, 2013 is where my digital practice started. Mm -hmm. uh, my digital practice purely was a self-prescribed punishment or task, if we can call it that. Um, just sitting in front of your laptop every day was getting uh, too much. And it was January 1st, 2013, a one year ended, another one began, and I was again in front of my laptop and I was like, what the hell? So I punished myself to type 2013 dots and spaces and I was not allowed to stop or move. And by the end of it, it didn't feel like much. This was not an art project. It was purely me just giving myself a task. Uh, then I started playing with colors and numbers. I started assigning each highlighter color numerical location on the page, started placing them there and numbers and repetition and that combination of playing with numbers and colors started forming patterns. And the patterns that were coming out were very referential of textiles. Mm -hmm. And slowly I learned the lesson 
Well, the realization came that textiles is just a series of numerical decisions. If you mm. ever look at the back of a carpet, the back of a carpet is just a bunch of pixels. Image making is pixels. So the two are speaking the same language. And that led to me designing a few carpets uh, digitally. And um, at the time, I used to talk a lot about, I'm going to get these carpets made and I'm going to get them made in Afghanistan. Of course, you dream as big as you can and you're not willing to make any compromises. Uh, but I never went ahead with it because nobody was willing to find me weavers that were physically in Afghanistan. And I really wanted the carpets to be made in that ground, experience that air, experience that uh, the dust, and be packed and shipped directly from Afghanistan out. Mm. And that put a pause on the project for about eight to nine years. So mm -hmm. I got them done in 2020, uh, thanks to my dad's university friend who was in Afghanistan at the time. And he was like, let me look into it. And he found me weavers that were active in Kabul. And he said, I'll get them made there. And it was a broken telephone. I sent them a JPEG, not much communication. And then one day I got a JPEG back, which was somebody's like phone photo of the carpet on a floor. And I was like, holy shit, it's real. It's real. And then the carpets were, uh, carpets arrived in Toronto right before the next chapter of Taliban taking over happened. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow. So, and now now they are going on exhibition. Is this coming exhibition yeah. is going so the to the coming exhibition as at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. Uh, originally, the carpets were shown in February as part of my solo show at the Tail Brown Gallery, also in Toronto. That's how the Aga Khan exhibition came about. Mm -hmm. uh, my solo show was called A Call Home. Um, with the with the idea that home is so inaccessible that you can only call call it or send a letter to it, and mm -hmm. my letter home was the JPEGs I sent and the message back I got was the carpets that I received. Um, but in that time, Afghanistan's political climate changed. Taliban took over. Um, it made it very difficult to put an exhibition because. Here I am trying to go on the Western elite platform of a gallery, trying to talk about Afghanistan in a positive light, talking mm -hmm. about culture and what we have to offer outside of the three things every single person knows, which is opium, Taliban, and terrorism. Um, outside of that, I want to talk about what more are we? And mm -hmm. then Taliban take over again. And I was like, how am I supposed to go into a gallery and still be like, look at these colorful things I made mm. and still be able to talk in that tone. And I had to eventually accept that if I was to cancel the exhibition, I am perpetuating the same problem, which is taking away opportunities where we could educate people still. Mm -hmm. And uh, the world around us as Afghans changes at a pace that I don't think we can keep up with. If we were to stop and cry every time something happened, I think we'd just be crying for the rest of our life. Uh, if we were to stop and say, well, let me mourn this one, and then I'll talk to you, we'd just be mourning for most of our life. Mm -hmm. So at the pace things are going, mm -hmm. if we were to constantly um, speak in the same lingo as media does, which is focus mm -hmm. on the negative and what's happening in that sense, yeah. then then who's going to do the part of talking about the positive? Mm -hmm. And that was reason enough to continue with it. The exhibition at Aga Khan is called Afghanistan, My Love. When they told me that's what they were calling the exhibition, because it's a two-part exhibition, it's me and a group of muralists from Afghanistan that are known as art lords. Mm -hmm. uh, they did the, all the murals on the blast walls in Kabul before Taliban which got painted over when Taliban came in. They're the other half of the exhibition. So when I heard about Afghanistan, my love as a title, I was like, are we moving away? Like it's almost for me immediately felt like the same thing. It's like, mm -hmm. things are so bad. How can we say mm -hmm. the word love in a situation like this? Mm -hmm. And then I had to also accept it again that why 
constantly take away the opportunities of positivity because that's exactly what a Taliban regime or hardships like that do. They mm-hmm. take away the opportunities of you ever having a positive experience in relation to something. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so beautifully, but it, it feels almost that we have to kind of thread the two parallel paths together. Um, you know, also that to me recently, but we can get to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it feels like it, it has to be kind of done almost together because yeah, this pause and go doesn't work in, in, a, in a sense because it's been 40 years of, you know, nonstop war mm-hmm. in a country. So, you know, is, is somebody supposed to, if some, if a, you know, five-year-old stopped to mourn and now they're 45, like, are they continued to mourn for another 45 years or, or is there, is there well, a time where it's, it's like, it's to, to think about a reality out there. It's almost mm-hmm. like a parallel universe uh, that there was somebody who was born in the middle of war. They became an adult. They had children and now their children's children are born. So somebody went from being a child to a grandfather and none of those generations actually got to see peace. And yet they still somehow imagine this thing that is so alien, Mm -hmm. but the hope with which they can actually continue for me, that's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It's like, how is that even possible? Like at which point, there's a human breakdown, but it goes to show the resilience is a real thing mm. and it's strong. It's mm-hmm. almost unbeatable at this point. Mm. So, multi-generational almost. Yeah. 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 yeah multi-generational. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know other than um, this beautiful artwork that you've put out these carpets, um, what other, themes or mediums you have explored or um, are looking forward to explore? Uh, I'm a painter outside of my digital practice. I've painted for longer than my digital practice, but um, I have to give credit to the digital practice because everything I'm talking about, none of this is things that are crossing my mind when I'm making work. I don't make work with an idea in my head or a concept I want to explore at least no longer. That's not what I'm trying to do anymore. At some point I made the decision that I just want to paint. I'm not painting because I'm trying to reference something. I'm not painting because I'm trying to say something anymore. I just want to paint. Um, It's almost like I'm trying to be a child, trying to find an opportunity to live as a child even if it's for like a split moment. So themes are, I mean, my digital practice, as my wife would call it, um, I gave myself art therapy through my digital practice without me really thinking about it or knowing it because my lens and my perspective changed without me really realizing it. Uh, Prior to my digital practice, my lens was quite coming from a harsh place. It was coming from a harsh place of criticism. I was, I was a do my, I felt like my practice was a critique of us as Afghans. What did we do wrong? How did we go wrong? Uh, where did patriarchy go wrong? Where did uh, us as people went wrong? So it's a constant like criticize, criticize, criticize is where the lens was coming from. And at some point I realized that I was just not thinking that way anymore. And this was because my digital practice had been going on for that whole time. My lens went from like criticize to curious, to want to try and understand what does it even mean to be who we are. And now I just feel like I'm on a research project of trying to understand who are we? And now I'm trying to understand who am I? So it's gone from like big picture to slowly smaller, smaller to it's going inwards. So Mm -hmm. I feel like my paintings are just me exploring me Mm. internally, trying to understand, uh, trying to understand fear, trying to understand uh, vulnerability because these things exist and we are really good at putting a bottle cap on it. 
mm. and putting it away and tucking it away. So that's where I think my brain is going. Mm -hmm. And my digital practice, I just let it go, just keeps going. And earlier yeah. I was mentioning, it's interesting how the lens changes. I went from a person who was making work about Afghanistan to me just making things and people think I'm making work about Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. right. So right. It's gone. My lens has gone in somebody else's head now. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing that evolutionary journey, because that's definitely, I think, the journey is the, uh, the jur journey is what is beautiful, I think, about life, right? Where we start, where we go, and, and what we discover in the process. Um, I, I mean, there are so many questions that come to mind. One I wanted to ask was, um, let me see if I could even form the question in my, it was in my head. And in terms of as an artist um, who is, you know, with roots in Afghanistan, um, what is unique, do you think, from a storytelling perspective? Um, what is really unique about being an Afghan artist? I think you've kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, you know, just these people who are displaced, right? Yeah. And, and us discovering ourselves. So I wanted to know what are some qualities or elements that kind of are unique to uh, a, per, a displaced person making art? You know, what elements come into play? You mentioned fear, you mentioned identity. I'm wondering if there is, I mean, I mentioned resilience, for example. I'm wondering, are there any thematic or conceptual concepts that kind of begin to emerge because of who you are and, and your background? I think the when it comes to the term diaspora and artist, the, the commonality is an attempt to try and understand okay. and equally trying to educate. Mm. We're trying to understand who we are in relation to the label that's assigned. And at the same time, just being prescribed the duty of having to explain and educate the label that we're assigned. So it's, it's like being the educator of something that you want to know more about. Mm -hmm. yeah? So mm -hmm. that's, that's where I see artists in diaspora, but mm -hmm. then the uniqueness that uniqueness of our situation, not really uniqueness of us uh, as Afghans, but I feel like the situation puts us in a uniquely different situation is that we don't just get to go back. Mm. I watch a lot of artist talks and in a lot of them, I've noticed somebody's from a certain country. They've lived outside because their family immigrated. They became an adult. They started making art and then they were like, I'm going to go home and I'm going to reconnect. So they get to go home and they reconnect and they get to talk to people, meet people and that informs their work. Um, the more I watch these, the more I'm like, but when, you know, like when, when do I get to do this? Mm -hmm. And the more I think about it, this is where it sounds negative, but it really, I don't see it as an option. I don't see it as an option of just, Go and do it. Our, our, our situation as being an Afghan and the circumstances of Afghanistan and the problems that lead to what we keep is watching and experiencing on repeat is that the situation is so complex that it's too complicated to be able to discuss and explain. Whenever I've said, well, home is inaccessible or we can't go home. I've actually been asked, yeah, but you can, right? And I'm like, well, if we get technical about it, yes, I can buy a ticket. Yes, I can get on a plane and get in a car and enter this, uh, this border. But am I going to experience it? Mm. as I would like to, and as I would like to being 
talk to people, connect with people, move around, see the country, explore it, see places you've never seen, you've only heard stories about. These are not options you have. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, no, mm -hmm. can't go. Mm -hmm. And can't go almost was like, it was getting close to being like, yeah, but starting to be an option. And then August 15th of last year happened. So mm -hmm. it's like, well, 20 years just got erased. Let's start over and start hoping again mm -hmm. that maybe this will change. So we can give, we can give up hope, but I would say that's the uniqueness of being an Afghan in diaspora is mm -hmm. that we are in this uh, strange place where we still have to continue trying to understand ourselves, and mm -hmm. still keep falling in the position of explaining what Afghanistan means and who we are. Mm -hmm. And yet it's less and less possible to really pinpoint what is it that we are or explain what is it that you think I am. Mm. Wow. 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 Simply, simply just, uh, <laughs> gems coming out of your mouth. <laughs> Uh, I, I can see you have given a lot of thought uh, and, and a lot of emotion into into all this. And, and um, yeah, there are so many, as, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the interview, I, I feel like, you know, this is one of those conversations we can talk for hours, but because yep. um, <laughs> we can be deeper. Point you want. I know, <laughs> because this is, this is just, there is so much depth. And, and I think as we, peel the layers. There's so much beautiful things that you say that I'm like, wow, I got to dig deeper and deeper. But um, I wanted to kind of give time for anything uh, you wanted to share, perhaps that you have not gotten up to up to this point, whether it's about your art, maybe it's about what we talked about. Um, anything that comes to mind that you would like to share, please do. Mm -hmm. Honestly, anything I can say will be like the Pandora's box. You know, you open yeah, exactly. the can of worms and it goes too far uh, or goes on for too long. Uh, no, really, great. really not much to, to add other than what I've said. Of course, there's a lot to add. But mm -hmm. as a quick closeout, if anyone's in Canada, this is where shameless advertising will come in. Okay. Uh, I've got an exhibition at the Aga Khan Museum. I've got a solo exhibition in New Brunswick in Sackville at Owens Art Gallery, which is part of, associated with uh, Mount Allison University. Um, and there's a show in Montreal and Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Another one coming up, Toronto. So if anyone gets a chance to go to any of these things, and I hope more Afghans find ways of uh, giving the platform to Afghanistan without explaining what Afghanistan is. I would really like to hear more questions. I would like to hear more people coming forward about the questions they have about who they are. And I think that's more important than constantly trying to define what, what Afghan means. Uh, mm. I know internally one Afghan meets the other and we all think we know more than the other. But um, I'd like to see a reality where Afghans just come to other Afghans like, I actually don't know anything. Can you tell me a little bit? And the less answers, the more questions, maybe we'll start painting a more realistic picture of who we are. Mm. Wow, wow, beautiful way to put that and a beautiful way to conclude that. Um, it has been really a pleasure to, uh, to speak with you. Uh, Shire John today, and um, I wish you the best of luck and 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 amazing works. I wish I was in Toronto so I could come to your exhibitions. But for the audiences who are out there, uh, please definitely check those out. And also, you have a lot of your work, most of your work online as well. So I would definitely encourage audiences to go ahead and check that out as well. So uh, thank Set you again. Up to date, every single thing you can think of is on there. It's there. But also, feel free to reach out. I'm quite an open book. Oh, wonderful. There you go. Reach out. Um, and if you're open for collaborations, perhaps they can reach out to you or just more information or have you in different places to exhibit. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, we'll close this session. I would just pause it, I would say, because there's no closing with you. It's, it's a, an ongoing <laughs> conversation. 
And once again, I thank you very much for being on the show, Shari John, and wishing you a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.